we had said on page 03 that the subclavian arteries are basically uh, are going to run right under the clavicle, thus the name subclavian, and they are carrying blood principally to the arms. Now, we did mention uh, that the first branch off the subclavian are the vertebral arteries, called vertebral because they go along the ver cervical vertebrae, and they also carry oxygenated blood up to your head, up to your brain, just as the internal carotid arteries do. So there's really two pairs of arteries carrying oxygenated blood to the brain, the right and left uh, internal carotids and the right and left vertebral arteries. Now, uh, the vertebral arteries actually join together when they're in the end of the skull and form what's called the basilar artery. But uh, then uh, we've got a list of a number of other arteries that I put in parentheses, and I said that I wasn't going to test you on them. Uh, it's not that they're un not uh, important, but I figure we've got a lot to learn. But what I did underline that I do want you to know is the axillary artery, the brachial artery, the radial artery, the ulnar artery, uh, the palmar arches and digital arteries. All of those things are underlined. So what are we talking about? Let's uh, look on page 08, and I made a note here, page 08, and we want to see how the blood flows into the arm. Now I'm going to walk you through this diagram on page 08, but your first thought is, wouldn't this be better if this was a nice pretty color picture? I want to remind you in your lab manual, figure 24.4. There's the same picture in color. But anyhow, looking at page 08, and I want to begin right up at the top, your top right, where it says brachiocephalic artery. So brachiocephalic artery, that's the arm head artery, it bifurcates, forming a common carotid artery carrying blood upwards to the head and a subclavian artery. That's the one we want to focus on. This is called subclavian because it's going to run right under the clavicle. That's the clavicle. Now, as the oxygenated blood is carrying in, carried in the subclavian, once it reaches the armpit, this is approximately the armpit, its name changes and it's called the axillary artery. And then as we follow this artery down, Right? The blood's just flowing, the oxygenated blood is flowing down it. So um, when it reaches around the middle of the uh, upper arm, it's called the brachial artery. Its name changes. And our first thought is, but that's so weird that its name keeps changing. In this case, changing from uh, the subclavian uh, to the axillary to the brachial. And as I like to point out, this is exactly what our freeway system does. If you're on the uh, Santa Monica <coughs> Freeway, heading east, now the Santa Monica Freeway is known as Interstate 10. Interstate 10. If you're heading east towards downtown, once you go past Staples Center, the Santa Monica Freeway's name changes to San Bernardino Freeway. It's still the Interstate 10. In fact, the Interstate 10 goes across the entire continental United States. So it'd be pretty silly to keep calling it Santa Monica Freeway when you're in the middle of Oklahoma. <laughs> All right, so the name keeps changing. This is true with the other freeways. Uh, Interstate 5, if you're up uh, going towards uh, through uh, the valley in Glendale, it's called Golden State Freeway. But if you head south, it's called the Santa Ana Freeway. It's the same Interstate 5. So the name changes. So this is no different. Here it's the uh, subclavian. Here it's the axillary. Here it's the brachial. Now, what the brachial artery bifurcates, there's my word, into a radial artery and an ulnar artery. And the radial we know is uh, the thumb side. And in the anatomic position, that's lateral in the anatomic position. Incidentally, commonly students will still ask me well, or when I, they read a question on exam, they'll say, do you mean in the anatomic position? <laughs> of course I mean that. What other position is there? That's why there's a reference position called an anatomic. All right? That's the, uh, anytime we explain where anything is, we assume we're talking about the anatomic position. 
So uh, anyhow, the radial artery is running along the thumb or lateral side. The ulnar artery is running along the little finger or medial side. And uh, incidentally, how we've heard of the radial artery is we've taken a radial pulse. So if you've ever felt your pulse palpated uh, your, around your wrist area to see if you're still alive, actually to find out what your heart rate is, you're actually palpating or feeling the radial artery. And you'll notice you're feeling on the uh, wrist area on the thumb side. And it runs right along the radial bone. Now, the, interestingly, the radial artery and the uh, ulnar artery literally loop together. They actually form a uh, arch right in the palm. Can you see where I try to show that? So it literally forms an arch. And it's shown very nicely, incidentally, in your lab manual, right here. Does everybody see that? And it's called the palmar arch, because it's deep in the palm of your hand. And then coming off that palmar arch are what are called digital arteries that go to uh, each of the uh, fingers. These are the digital arteries. All right, so that's how the blood is uh, flowing uh, through the uh, arm. So all of these things that I just mentioned were underlined back on page 03. Back on page 03, axillary, brachial, radial, ulnar, uh, palmar, arch, and digital arteries. Now, um, let's, let's just show you uh, how this uh, relates. On this handout that you should have, this is the uh, one-page handout where I said we wanted you to memorize both sides of the page. And I want to look at side two for a moment. Side two. And on side two, it says, trace the path of blood from the left ventricle to the right hand back to the right atrium. And let's follow this for a moment. Now, what this is, this is as if I map quested. Anybody ever do a map quest? A map quest is like you say, here's where I am. I need to get to from point A to point B. And they will tell you, they don't list every single freeway and street in Los Angeles. They only tell you which streets or freeways you need to take to get from point A to point B. So we want to go from the left ventricle to the right hand. That's our map quest. So, and then we'll go back. How do we get from the left ventricle to the right hand? We obviously start with the left ventricle. That's where we are. Now, the left ventricle ejects the blood out into the aorta. Notice what I'm doing is I'm forcing you not only to learn the names of the vessels, but to understand how the blood flows through them. Now, we know that the uh, blood is going to go out the uh, uh, aorta. We have learned on page uh, 05, on uh, 05, we know that the aorta is really big. So there's a whole bunch of arteries branching off aorta. So which turnoff, one aorta, which turnoff do we take if we want to go to the right arm? Do we take a coronary artery turnoff? No, that would take us to the heart. Do I want to take a, 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 a superior mesenteric artery turnoff? No, that would take us to the small intestine. So if I want to go to the right arm, look, we're going to take we have to get under the right subclavian artery. That takes us to the right arm. But actually, we're going to get off the aortic arch onto the brachiocephalic artery turnoff, which becomes this. Does everybody see it? It works just like a map quest, where it would tell you the order of the streets to take. So let's see on our, our diagram, we're going to go ascending aorta, aortic arch. And then we're looking for the brachiocephalic artery turnoff. We take that, then we take the right subclavian artery. We're not going to go up to the common carotid artery to the head. And the right subclavian, as we follow it into the, uh, under the armpit, it becomes known as the axillary artery. As it reaches the middle of the arm, it's called the brachial artery. As, we, as the brachial artery uh, goes into the forearm, it bifurcates into a right radial and a right ulnar artery. And uh, finally, it forms a palmar arch. And then we have the capillaries of the right hand. Here's my amazing picture of the palmar arch. Um, incidentally, the arteries and veins are like freeways. 
And, uh, and the capillaries are the surface streets. So in other words, just as a way of thinking of this, if you uh, were on the San Diego freeway and you wanted to go to Cal State Northridge, CSUN, what's the turnoff most people would take off the San Diego freeway to go to Cal State Northridge? Nordhoff. Has anybody ever heard of Nordhoff? Yeah. Nobody. Okay, so you take the Nordhoff turnoff off the freeway, and then you'd be on the surface streets. The surface streets are the capillaries. And you can think of each of the houses and buildings as a cell. All right, so the capillaries are running right along by the cells. Each, all these houses are cells. And so that's how the oxygen and nutrients now can go to every single house, to every single cell. Incidentally, once you've uh, gone to uh, wherever you wanted to go on the surface streets, you want to go back the other direction, you get back onto the freeway, which is a vein, and you just go in the reverse direction. Right? So everybody follow the analogy. So anyhow, we've made it to the capillary bed of the right hand. Now, uh, we haven't talked about the veins yet. Uh, so in fact, let's look at the uh, veins. Uh, just before we do, on page 09, on page 09, now, the veins are a little bit more complicated than the arteries. You say, thank you very much. You see, all the arteries are deep in our body. The arteries are very deep, and they're under high blood pressure. They have a high blood pressure in these arteries. They're deep, usually right next to a bone, because we don't want to cut an artery. Sometimes we cut ourselves, and we don't want to cut an artery. Because if you cut an artery, the blood will spurt out about three to four feet into the air, and you can lose all the blood in your body in a matter of minutes. So they're all deep. On the other hand, veins, uh, the blood pressure is low in a vein, and we actually have veins that are not only deep, right next to the arteries, those are called the deep veins, they're right next to the artery, and usually have the same name. But we also have these superficial veins. These are the veins we see when we look at our arms, when we look at uh, our legs, and we can see these superficial veins, and we sometimes cut them. The good news is you're not going to usually bleed to death because the blood pressure is pretty low, and all you have to do is apply pressure and ice, and it, and, and it forms a clot, and it seals off, and you don't really bleed to death. Um, but we need, do need to mention not only some of the deep veins, but some of the superficial veins, especially in the arms. Because for those of you going into nursing, nurse practitioner, physician's assistant, almost every patient who's in the hospital is on IV drip. And they are connected by an IV drip line to one of these superficial veins almost always in the arms. So we need to have some understanding of those. So uh, back on page uh, on the handout. So we're going to first talk about the deep veins, and then we'll mention the superficial veins. Now, the deep veins are running in exactly the opposite direction as the arteries. Look, I made this amazing picture here. Look at that. Isn't that impressive? This is supposed to be a hand. Just as we had a radial artery and an ulnar artery that formed an arch called the palmar arch, deep in the palm of our hand, we have a palmar venous arch that forms a radial vein and an ulnar vein where blood just going in the reverse direction. Now you might say, you know, Professor Bain, that's really disgusting, that picture. Really, isn't there a better picture that we have? Yes, it's figure 2411. There it is, it's, pretty, it's beautiful. All right, so it's in your lab manual. All you have to do is open up your lab manual. So you want to see it, but all right, so the, the name of the deep veins are exactly like the arteries, and we're just going in the reverse direction. So we go from the palmar venous arch, right in the palm, deep in our, this is deep in our palm. There's a radial vein and an ulnar vein, and the blood is just flowing in the exact reverse direction. <laughs> All right, so it's going through the radial vein and ulnar vein, and the radial vein and ulnar vein join together to form a brachial vein. The brachial vein becomes the axillary vein when it reaches the armpit. The axillary vein becomes the subclavian vein as it runs under the clavicle, which becomes, it joins up with the jugular vein to form the brachiocephalic vein, and the brachiocephalic vein joins 
the right left brachiocephalic veins join together to form the superior vena cava, which bring blood to the right atrium. Now, this is exactly, essentially, the reverse order of what we saw with the arteries. Now, you might say, but I'm a little confused at that very last part. So to help unconfuse you, let's look at that 12-page uh, that handout of the blood vessels, uh, of uh, all the organs and blood vessels that you're responsible for finding on the cat. Uh, let's just look at the very last page. And on the very last page, you've got this picture on page 12. And this picture is basically going to show you exactly what we've said. Okay, here's the subclavian vein. And this is the bloods coming back to the heart. Veins carry blood to the heart. And there's actually a, a right and a left subclavian vein. We're focusing on the right. Here's the jugular vein. And that's bringing blood from the head. And where they join together, that means a vein from the head joins with a vein from the arm, forming a arm head vein, a brachiocephalic vein. The same thing is happening on this side, the left side. So there is a left brachiocephalic vein, and they, the blood joins together to form the superior vena cava. And so the superior vena cava brings blood from the upper part of the body back to the heart, to the right atrium specifically. Uh, the, uh, it's, it's, so the superior vena cava is bringing blood from the upper part of the body, the head, and the arms. Does everybody see that? So this is the right subclavian becomes the right brachiocephalic, which becomes the superior vena cava. That's exactly what we see here. Here it is. The, uh, these are exactly in the reverse order as we listed them for the arteries. And then uh, here's the uh, superior vena cava and right atrium. Has everybody got that? Now, um, uh, on, this, on this diagram, I now want to mention the superficial vein. So these were the deep veins. These were the deep veins. And the deep veins are right next to the arteries. They're right next to the arteries. Now let's look at the superficial veins. These are called superficial because they're right near the surface of our skin. Now we don't have superficial arteries. That would be very dangerous, as we've explained, because we don't want to cut them. Now, there's really a whole bunch of superficial veins. We're just going to mention uh, uh, three of them by name, just three, that are very important. First off, uh, well, actually four. First off, it, we begin with what's called the dorsal venous arch. Now, the palmar venous arch was in the palm of your hand. It's deep. Your palm is fleshy. It's thick. It's a lot of, a lot of tissue there. It's deep. Your artery is deep in the palm, and the deep veins are deep in your palm. But look on the surface, the dorsum of your hand. Can you see some veins there? In fact, if you know anything about uh, the hospital setting, this is the second favorite place to connect an IV drip line, is on the dorsum of the hand. So if they haven't connected you up with uh, an IV drip line in the anti-cubital space, which is the favorite place, this is the second favorite place on the dorsum of the hand. There's really a whole bunch of veins, but we say overall we call it a dorsal venous arch. Dorsal means on the dorsum of the hand, there's a venous arch, superficial. There's really a whole bunch of veins there. Now, there are two major veins that come off that dorsal venous arch, a basilic vein and a cephalic vein. And so there's really more than that, but there's two major ones. Now, they start off on the dorsal side or posterior side of your hand, but they swing over. They swing over to the anterior side. So as you look in your forearm, you can see a lot of superficial veins in your forearm. All right? There's a whole bunch of them, but we commonly say there are two major ones. There is a basilic vein running along the medial side in the anatomic position. It's always anatomic position. And there is a cephalic vein running along the lateral side. I'll give you a mnemonic or memory aid in just a moment. 
Now, the basilic is actually going to connect. It's going to dive down deep and connect to the brachial vein, deep in your middle of your upper arm. The cephalic dives down deep and connects a little bit higher up to the axillary vein. So it just connects a little bit higher up in your arm. But the most important of all of these is this vein right here called the median cubital vein, which is an anastomosis. What does anastomosis mean? Have we ever learned that word? Nobody knows. Page N2, it means an interconnection. N2, it is an interconnection between the basilic and the cephalic. Here's what we're saying. If you look in the anticubital space on the front side of your elbow, now we know we're talking about now the favorite place to draw blood, the favorite place to connect an IV drip line. This is it. All right? You will see at least one vein, sometimes more than one, but at least one kind of running at an angle. Can you see that? It's usually kind of running at an angle. You might see more than one. That is the median cubital vein. It is really connecting. It's a connection between the basilic and the cephalic. The basilic on the medial side and the cephalic on the lateral. Now, if you really want to see that vein well, so obviously, if they were really going to draw blood from you or try to put up a, a, connect a line, they would put a rubber band around your upper arm so that the blood fills up that vein. Since we don't have rubber bands, all you need to do is whatever arm you want to look at, take the hand, your other hand, and put pressure on the medial side of your upper arm, put media, pressure on the medial side, and pump your hand. And as you pump your hand, if you're putting pressure, you should see these veins fill up. Now, the veins are much more obvious in guys than women, because the veins are more superficial and larger in, in men than they are in women. But uh, I think you can see mine is really obvious right there. Makes it easy for them to uh, draw blood. It's right in here. And you can sometimes see more than one. That's the median cubital vein. All right, so you need to know dorsal venous arch, basilic vein, median cubital vein, and cephalic, and where they connect. Let me give you some mnemonics or memory aids. Uh, I, I heard this from a student I had many years ago. Uh, I, I used to tell my students, just memorize it. It's just four veins. Just memorize it. And uh, one semester, I had a student, and she said, oh, it's easy for me to remember uh, this. And I said, oh, how do you remember it? She said, well, you see, I have a Mercedes Benz. And I said, that's nice. <laughs> and she said, get it, Mercedes Benz, the median basilic, the medial basilic. The basilic is on the medial side. And you see, the basilic connects with the brachial. So it's MBB. So just remember, the basilic, right, Mercedes Benz, is on the medial side in the anatomic position, and it connects to the brachial, basilic to brachial. So if you can remember that, then the other one, the cephalic must be, if the basilic is medial, the cephalic is lateral, it's the other side, and it just, just connects a little bit higher up, a little bit higher up in the uh, ar uh, arm, that same uh, vein, just a little bit higher up. And the most important, of course, is this anastomosis between the two, the basilic and the cephalic, that runs a diagonally at an angle in the, in the anticubital space. So there are many more than these, but that gives you a sense of some of the most important superficial veins uh, that if you're going to be a nurse, you're going to see most patients who are hospitalized are on IV drip, uh, so intravenous drip lines. So let's put this together. We have uh, the deep veins, which are right next to the arteries, and they generally have the same name as the arteries. And then we have the superficial veins that connect to the deep veins, a little, uh, a little bit higher up in the body. So we have now walked you through this side of this handout. Does that make sense? And I'm forcing you, basically, to understand how did the blood go from your heart to your hand, and then how did it get back to your heart? So uh, now, the other one we're going to learn is on the first side. Now, on the uh, first side, so uh, let's take a look at this. 
So it says, trace the path of blood from the right atrium to the small intestine back to the right atrium. All right, notice we're beginning on the right pump, not the left pump. And the right pump's got to pump blood through the lungs before we would make it to the left pump. So the blood goes from the right atrium to the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, the right ventricle ejects the blood out into the pulmonary artery trunk. And the pulmonary artery trunk bifurcates into a right pulmonary artery and a left pulmonary artery. These pulmonary arteries bring the blood to the lungs, the capillary beds of the lung, where the blood picks up oxygen, it gains oxygen, and gets rid of CO2. And now the blood comes back through four pulmonary veins to the left atrium. Two pulmonary veins from the right lung, two pulmonary veins from the left lung. And if you're thinking, didn't you show us a, a flow chart earlier today that was like this? The answer is yes, on page 017. On 017, this is what we showed you earlier today about how the blood went from the right atrium to the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery trunk to the right left pulmonary arteries uh, to the uh, pulmonary veins to the left atrium. That was page 017. So yes, we did show you the same thing earlier today. OK, now, we've made it to the left atrium. Now we're in the left pump. And the left pump, the blood goes from the left atrium into the left ventricle. Notice again, I am forcing you to learn how blood flows through the body. You say, how are you forcing me? Because I'm, I'm going to ask you these things, and you have to memorize them. So uh, the blood goes from the, this oxygenated blood goes from the left atrium to the left ventricle, and the left ventricle ejects the blood out into the largest blood vessel in the entire body called the aorta. Now again, here on page 05, here's this huge aorta. Now, where, what's, what's the uh, map quest? Where are we trying to go? You say, I don't know. We're trying to go to the small intestine. So now we've got to ask, which turn off do we take off the aortic freeway to get to the small intestine? Our first thought is, I don't know. Well, that's why I'm forcing you to learn it. So we understand if we wanted to go to the heart, we take the coronary arteries turn off. If we wanted to go to the right arm, we take a, we take a, a brachiocephalic and right subclavian artery turn off. If we wanted to go up to the head, we'd go up the carotid arteries to the head. Now, where do we want to go? We want to go to the small intestine. So we have learned, we have learned on page uh, o, uh, on 04. On page 04, we had mentioned that these are some of the major arteries off the, coming off the abdominal aorta. And they include the celiac artery, the superior mesenteric artery, the renal artery, the inferior mesenteric artery. And you need to find all of those on the cap. And so which one of these turnoffs off the abdominal aorta takes us to the small intestine? The superior mesenteric artery turnoff. Incidentally, all of this was summarized as well. Remember this? The celiac takes us to the uh, stomach, liver, pancreas, and spleen. Superior mesenteric artery turn off to the small intestine. Inferior mesenteric artery to the large intestine. And you can see this as you look at the cat. You can see where these go. All right, so with that in mind, looking at uh, our assignment then, so uh, we, uh, we take the uh, ascending aorta, we're going to stay on the aortic freeway, aortic arch. We're not getting off at the aortic arch. We're uh, thoracic aorta, abdominal aorta. Now we're in the aorta, down in the abdomen. We take the superior mesenteric artery turnoff. Now you can see that on the cat. You should have already seen that red blood vessel going to the small intestine coming off the abdominal aorta. How many of you saw that on the cat? All right, so you know, you've seen it. So you should be able to see, trace a lot of this right on the cat, how it's doing this. All right, now we finally make it to the capillary beds of the small intestine. Right, we get off on the st surface streets. Now, where do we go next? Our next thought is, I have no idea. 
So now let's look at page 014. Page 014. And on page 014, this is page 014. If you've watched any of the videos, I talk about this picture on one of the videos. This is showing the hepatic portal system. And if you've watched the video, I actually show a cat that was specially injected with yellow to show these veins that make up the hepatic portal system. You'd say, I don't even know what you're talking about. Let me remind you. Let's actually remind you of something we covered back in section J. You'd say, back in section J? Yes. On uh, section J, page J31. Uh, On J31, this is J31, we learned that all the blood that went through the digestive tract is going to be carried by a hepatic portal vein right to the liver. Because we know that nutrients, water-soluble nutrients, are absorbed from the digestive tract and they are carried to the liver where those nutrients can be processed and stored. So we've got to go to the liver and uh, from there, then it'll go out of the liver through the hepatic vein to the inferior vena cava. This was J31. So here's, here's what's going on. Here it shows on, on O14, it shows a lot of these veins from the digestive tract. I'm going to ask you to know three of these, right? You can see them on the cat. Here is the superior mesenteric vein that's bringing blood and the nutrients that were absorbed from the small intestine. Here is the splenic vein, which is bringing blood from the rest of the digestive tract, including, I'm not asking you to know it, the large intestine. And they join together. It forms like an upside down Y. And they join together to form the hepatic portal vein that takes you right to the liver. Can everybody see it's like an upside down Y? And that's how the blood gets to the liver. And we've got a cat out that looks absolutely identical to that. Please don't break it up. That break, be careful with the vessels, because I'll use that exact cat on the test if it's not destroyed. Let's see where we were on this chart. On the chart, so it shows we had made it to the small intestine. Now, the blood comes from the small intestine, goes through the superior mesenteric vein. Notice that name is just the opposite of the superior mesenteric artery. But now we're heading back towards the heart. But we've got to go through the liver first on the way to the heart. Because all the nutrients that were absorbed from the digestive tract have to be carried to the liver. Incidentally, this was also shown on this handout. Remember this handout? Doesn't this show how the blood goes through the intestine and then it's carried by the hepatic portal vein to the liver and then leaves the liver through the hepatic vein and goes to the inferior vena cava? So this is showing the same thing. All right, so superior mesenteric vein, hepatic portal vein, now we go to the capillary beds of the liver because the nutrients are going to go out of the bloodstream to those liver cells where the sugars will be stored as glycogen in the liver cells and amino acids can be stored as proteins in the liver cells. The blood leaves the liver through the hepatic vein. This is shown on this picture right here. Here's the hepatic vein where the blood goes out of the liver. And it was shown on this picture right here on J31. The blood leaves the liver through the hepatic vein to the inferior vena cava. Of course, you've got much nicer pictures in your lab manual. And uh, it goes through the inferior vena cava, which is the fast track right up to the liver. Right, the inferior vena cava is bringing that blood right up to, I'm sorry, did I say the liver, to the right atrium of the heart. Fast track right up to the heart. <clears throat> now, there's a vein that some of you have already uh, asked me about. It's in the list to find on the cat called the azagos vein. And the azagos vein is an alternate route that allows the blood to go from the uh, uh, lower part of the body back up to the heart, 
But the azygos connects to the superior vena cava rather than to the inferior vena cava. Now, where I mention the azygos vein, where I specifically mention it by name, is uh, on the bottom of page 013. I mention at the bottom of 013 the azygos vein. And it runs, runs right along the vertebral column. And it connects, it empties into, it connects to the superior vena cava. And I wrote that uh, it's an alternate route of venous return to the heart. So looking at this diagram, here's what we're showing. The blood can go from the lower part of the body through the inferior vena cava, which it normally does to the right atrium, or it can go through the azygos, which connects to the superior vena cava, which obviously connects to the right atrium. Now you might say, I don't get this. Why do we have this? Let me ask you a question. I'm going to use a draw an, an analogy. If you wanted to go up to Oxnard, you'd say, why do I want to go? Okay, you want to go to Oxnard, Ventura County. The fastest way to get up to Ventura County, to Oxnard, is to take the Ventura Freeway 101, go right up past the Calabasas and all that, right to Oxnard and Ventura. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Now, what if you were told that they had closed the Ventura Freeway, which has happened when they've had fires, like around Calabasas. Sometimes they've closed the Ventura Freeway. And you need to get up to Ventura County. Is there any way to go? You can take Highway 1, the Coast Highway, Pacific Coast Highway. Now, there's always people going up Highway 1 to Oxnard. Obviously, the fastest main route is, uh, is, high, uh, is uh, Freeway 101, the 101 freeway, the Ventura Freeway. But if they close the Ventura Freeway, then more traffic is going to go up Highway 1. So here's the idea. The, this is the Ventura Freeway. From the lower part of the body to the heart is the inferior vena cava. That's the major thoroughfare, the Ventura Freeway. This is the Pacific Coast Highway, Highway 1, the Azagos. It's an alternate way. There's always, most traffic is going this way from the lower part of your body to your heart. There's a few cars going this way. If, this, if you had a blockage in your inferior vena cava, so the blood cannot go from the lower part of your body to your heart this way, that, then more traffic will be diverted this way. But at least you won't die. Because this way the blood can still make it back to your heart. So the blood's always flowing through this azygos vein. And, it, and for those of you who found it on the cat, it's significant. It's not like it's not there. If, if you, it's actually longer, because it's actually coming from the lower part of the body. It may not have gotten fully injected with the blue plastic. So, but it is sizable. If you couldn't see it, I wouldn't even mention it. But in fact, it's actually quite significant in size. So that's the azygos vein. So we have now described in, in its to entirety map questing. How do we go from the right atrium to the small intestine? And we showed you. And how did we get back from the small intestine back to the heart? So does everybody follow that? So hopefully now, as you walk your way through it, it makes more sense. And you can find not all of it, but much of this on the cat. For example, beginning with uh, the aortic arch, you should be able to see on the cat, the aortic arch, the thoracic aorta, abdominal aorta, superior mesenteric artery, the small intestine. Looking at the specially injected cat, you can see the superior mesenteric vein and hepatic portal vein. You can see all that using these cats. So the, we're using the cats to help us learn how the blood flows through our body. Now, you actually notice that uh, if you were to look on page 018, uh, don't freak out, but on page uh, 018, I show how uh, blood flows from the left ventricle to your right foot. I'm not going to ask you to know that. On 019, I show how blood goes from your heart to your stomach. And my favorite, on 020, is how blood goes from the heart to your brain. I'm not asking you to know that. I used to when I was a younger, meaner person. You'd say, you seem awfully mean now. No, I'm much nicer than I used to be. I was much more demanding when I was a younger, a younger uh, teacher. Anyhow, so, uh, but I, I've given you two examples 
the, those are the two I've asked you to know, so we get a general sense of how blood flows through our body. Because it was my experience that students could memorize the names of blood vessels, but when I asked them, well, okay, so how's the, where's the blood going? How does it get from here to there? Students didn't understand how it would move through our body. This would be like if you had memorized the names, San Diego Freeway, Santa Monica Freeway, Santa Ana Freeway, but you really didn't know how they connected, how to get from point A to point B. All you did is know the names of the freeways. We want you to understand how blood flows through the body. And that's it, because that's functionally what's really important. Okay, uh, the, the, uh, as far as uh, what we've achieved today then, we've essentially finished section O. We have finished section of.